It was December of 2008, almost 10 years ago to the day. I swung open the door and hustled through a sea of people toward the line for security. Everyone in front of me was lugging their backpacks onto the conveyor belt and their coins, keys, headphones, and wallets into plastic bins. I walked to the scanner and immediately shook my head in bewilderment. It was 8 a.m., my brain wasn't firing fully, and I'd stupidly left my belt and wallet on. It's fine, said the security guard as she patted me down and scanned over me with that giant metal plastic wand, metal detecting wand, and motioned me forward. This scene might seem really familiar to a lot of people in this room, but it's not quite as it seems. I wasn't walking into a place where I had expected to see this setup. I wasn't going to an airport. I wasn't walking into a highly secured federal DC building. I was walking into Ballou Senior High School, a public school in Southeast Washington, DC. I proceeded to the administrator's office where I had previously scheduled a month in advance a meeting with the principal to talk about a new HIV prevention project that I was interested in launching with his teenagers. But when I approached the front desk, the receptionist very casually told me the principal wasn't coming to school that day. Frustrated, I walked down the hall hoping to find a health or a PE teacher, but I was stopped in my tracks quickly when the bell rang and security guards promptly pulled down gridded metal gates, locking down every hallway. When class was in session at Ballou, students were secured into a space of about 30 yards for their safety, they said. Because students had been doing anything they could to escape Ballou. We were in the fourth month of the semester and students had set desks on fire on four separate occasions already. To escape a test, to pick a fight in the parking lot, or maybe as a sign of pure protest protest against a system that gave them zero promise for their future. Who wouldn't want to resort to whatever it took to get out of an environment as energy-sucking, as fear-inducing, and as hopeless as what I saw that day at Ballou? I was not the least bit surprised to find out later on that students at Ballou had some of the worst graduation rates in the United States, and the chances of them ending up in prison were almost as high as the chances that they might end up in college. How had we failed students like this? How had I, living just miles from this school for nearly two years, never realized that this was the experience of teenagers, of public school students, right in my backyard? I didn't have the answers, but I can tell you that I realized right then that I needed to educate myself. I've now spent 10 years, almost to the day, <clears throat> in and out of DC classrooms, and I'm still learning. In my family, school is a means to an end and a ticket to a job. My dad and his dad had both diligently used school as a training ground to become doctors. The classroom was a bridge to a career where they could help ease suffering and provide healing to people in need. I used to wonder if I'd end up like my dad and my dad's dad. But as a young kid, my experience visiting his work made me realize that I absolutely hated hospitals. My dad would bring me into the on-call room from time to time and after pinches on the cheek from every nurse and offering of unlimited free snacks and all the TV I wanted, I'd curiously sneak out, open the door, and peek into the hallway. And while I know a lot of great things happen in hospitals, the sight of the jungle of machines and tubes and of families worrying about loved ones made me sick. I knew from a young age that I didn't want to follow my family's path. My mission was going to be the opposite. I wanted to stay as far away from hospitals as I possibly could. In 2006, I found myself really, really far from that hospital where my dad worked, about as far away as I possibly could have been. I was studying abroad in South Africa in a really rural area and staying with a local family. One night, one of my South African friends and I were having dinner, and his phone was buzzing constantly. I told him to answer it. And when he did, within minutes, his face was frozen. His ex-girlfriend was calling him to tell him that she'd been diagnosed with HIV. And she was so scared to tell anyone about it, she thought her life was over. And that night, she had planned to commit suicide. Fortunately, my friend talked her out of it. And I'll tell you, she's living a healthy life today. But when I came away from that experience, I wondered how was HIV so prevalent, despite being preventable, and even worse, why were people considering suicide when, at least in theory, 
treatment was available for free. That experience lit a fire in me. I returned from my study abroad trip and I wrote my dean a letter saying that I wanted to study public health. I told him I wanted the rest of my undergraduate career to be about learning more about what I'd experienced in South Africa and about thinking about solutions. We didn't have a public health major at UVA. So he supported me in just creating my own major. I studied politics, biology, anthropology, and history. And in my research, I discovered a small NGO that was using soccer in South Africa as a tool to break the ice around talking about HIV. I remember back to my time, my first time in South Africa, where talking about soccer in the World Cup was part of nearly every conversation with every person I met. But uttering the word HIV, despite how many people it affected, brought a room to complete silence. I spent three summers volunteering to train professional soccer players to be the one who could break this silence. The model worked. We proved it using a randomized control trial design, and the number of stories I could tell you about people we impacted is limitless. And at the risk of sounding cliche, the work profoundly impacted my life. I laugh at it now, but when I was a teenager, I had bought into the false idea that I could be a professional athlete. And my entire identity was built... It's that funny? <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty good. I was pretty good. Um, but my entire identity was built around being an athlete. Um, and when injury stole that dream from me, when I, when I knew I wouldn't be successful in Division I athletics, I felt really lost. And when I reflected, I realized how selfish that was, that athletics could be such a huge part of who I was as a person. Being able to use something that I was comfortable with, though, sports, to make a difference that was so much bigger than myself changed me. Every single time I came back from DC after working in South Africa, I was immediately looking for flights back. I thought that's where I'd end up spending most of my time in life and doing my work in public health. But in my final year of school, I was asked to create a one-page fact sheet on HIV for a local organization. HIV was a problem in the 90s in the US, right? Surely if the US was giving so much money to fight this disease internationally, we'd had figured out a solution at home. But this was far from the truth. What was supposed to start as a simple project turned into hours of research for me because one in 20 people in Washington, D.C. was living with HIV. The prevalence at home and the capital of the wealthiest country in the Western Hemisphere was higher than it was in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So I took the model that I'd seen work so well in South Africa, and I spent seven weeks with a group of teenagers adapting it for D.C. We called it the Grassroot Project. I recruited student athletes, my teammates and other athletes at my university to become HIV prevention educators. And since then, a thousand athletes have joined our organization from five different universities, and we've facilitated 50,000 hours of free sexual health education to students in more than 60 schools across DC. We reversed the narrative and forced the issue of DC's health crisis into the spotlight by speaking out on local, national, and international news outlets about the fact that something that was developed in Africa was making a huge difference right at home on a problem that had been largely ignored. I came into the Leaders for Health Equity Fellowship this year because I realized that HIV wasn't just a smart virus, a virus that attacked the very system that was designed to fight it, but that it also illuminated some of society's greatest problems. Stigma, discrimination, poverty, and a health system that in my opinion had lost its way. HIV in DC was the result of politics that banned comprehensive sex ed until 2009. And despite a doubling of new HIV cases among teenagers, my city had no plan in place to provide students with access to critical HIV prevention services and education. And leadership, our HIV AIDS administration in the DC Department of Health had had six leaders in the previous 12 years. The office was a revolving door. As part of a year-long fellowship this year with you all, I've explored the idea of health equity. The concept has become the prevailing buzzword at conferences across the country, and it always distances itself from this idea of health equality. Equality, we say, means giving everyone equal resources, but equity means meeting people wherever they are and giving them the specific resources that they need to thrive. The first time I was lectured about this difference between equality and equity, Honestly, it didn't sit well with me. Why are we seeking equity when in America, 
And in Washington, D.C., we are so, so, so far away from even equality in the first place. We're not bought into the idea that people are treated equal. We're not ready as a country to agree, to agree that humans should have equal rights. And despite telling ourselves the narrative that America is the land of opportunity, it is statistically one of the least socially mobile developed countries in the world. And while I already knew that America was far from a place of equality, I've learned in the last year that even talking about equity in mainstream society is going to require a major disruptive shift in our mindsets. For this reason, I changed my project mid-year to focus on people, to focus on the student athletes in my organization. I believe that we need more equity warriors fighting on the front lines for better health and better health care, and I saw athletes as an untapped resource. During my experience as an undergrad athlete, I saw so many elite athletes, much better than I was, who possessed so many skills that be, could, be, can, could be translatable to this work. A relentless spirit, discipline, the ability to work really hard as a team toward a lofty goal. And this summer, with the help of some of the people in this room, I launched a new project that invests heavily in the community organizing abilities, the cultural competency, and the advocacy skills of the athletes that work for the Grassroot Project. Our goal was to show how powerful they could be off the field, to show them that the problems we had in DC were huge, but they could in some way be part of the solution. Um, I believe that equity will only be realized if not one, but two things can occur. First, we've got to put the people whose voices have been silenced in the past, we've got to put them front and center, let them speak and let them call the shots. But second, we also have got to recognize that even if we did have more decision making and resources allocated to underrepresented groups, I still don't think we'd solve all of our problems. We can't distance ourselves from those who have had power and privilege, but instead we've got to get closer to them. We've got to engage with them, debate with them, and turn them into allies. Educate them and call them out when they need to be called out, but also be open to two-way channels of communication. We don't just need students from Baloo and their parents and teachers to help us change education or health policy in Southeast DC. We also need people like the naive 20 year old, 22 year old me to become aware of these problems, to engage with them and to bring, as my health equity squad has preached throughout the year, critical eyes and open hearts. I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity not just to be called out during my work, and I believe I have been many times, but also to have been called into this work. I'm still a work in progress and my work is still a work in progress, but I'm so grateful to everyone in this room and to this fellowship for supporting me, challenging me, and keeping me learning. Thank you.